Welcome to Therapeutics. In this block, we'll try in about an hour or so to review the basics of uh, diabetes uh, pharmacotherapy. And there is a lot here to cover, uh, but we'll try to do it fairly succinctly uh, with probably more content-dense slides uh, than many presentations. The second presentation will also be a review of the diabetes care recommendations for 2019 from the American Diabetes Association. And again, there's lots of detail here, but what I'll try to do in a fairly succinct way is to provide overview for that in the second presentation as well. So our goals here are to review uh, the management of diabetes particularly, and also how we manage some acute states uh, with hypo and hyperglycemic states. We'll also talk a bit about managing uh, prediabetes or metabolic syndrome, as well as the overview of management of diabetes type 1, and particularly because it's the major issue in healthcare, a major issue in healthcare, review of diabetes type 2. There are lots of resources for clinicians for diabetes, uh, but probably the best one I can uh, uh, share with you is what the American Diabetes Association publishes uh, each uh, January or late December of the year before, uh, and their guidelines come out updated every year for standards of care, uh, and I encourage you to go to the American Diabetes uh, website to download this document. We'll also review a lot of the key features in this entire nearly 200-page document in the second presentation. So the document I'm referring to, the ADA guidelines, published every January. Uh, and over the last five years or so, there have been some major changes in our approach to diabetes. Uh, and so because there are new therapies involved, there are new approaches uh, to those therapeutic options, uh, the updates happen every year and they're continually occurring. So as an overview of diabetes, classically, uh, we think of either type 1 diabetes or type 2. Uh, type 1 diabetes, uh, where patients will require insulin. Uh, type 2 diabetes, where patients may or may not require insulin, but can often be managed without insulin uh, early in their course of therapy. But truth be told, there's probably more layers of types of diabetes than this older, simplistic type 1 and type 2 uh, presentation. Uh, about a year ago or so, there was some publication in Lancet that began to look at subsets of diabetes more than the classic type 1 and type 2. And within those subsets or clusters, they identified uh, classic type 1 where there's often a uh, severe autoimmune basis to diabetes and also a severe insulin deficient diabetes, uh, which look like cluster 1, uh, but uh, they, they may vary in their presentation. And then on a spectrum, we see uh, uh, anything from cluster three, four, and five that relate to age-related or obesity-related uh, diabetes, uh, and usually in patients who are overweight. And those sort of are different presentations within the classic type two diabetes. The other thing that this alludes to is something called prediabetes or metabolic syndrome. And so that's gonna be an issue as a clinician. We think of a lot of patients who are in that category. Uh, if they don't do changes in their lifestyle, diet and exercise, uh, they likely will be at high risk for developing type two diabetes. So older terms, the maturity onset diabetes of the young uh, is also a variation of diabetes. We see uh, where it's a uh, classic uh, uh, is, issue of genetic impairment of insulin secretion, uh, where those folks do require insulin as well. There's also gestational diabetes seen during pregnancy. We'll talk a bit about that as well. Prediabetes, uh, we alluded to, uh, and then other variations. So all of this in the pathophysiology of diabetes, it's evolving in how we classify or think of diabetes. Our goals in the management of patients with diabetes, classically, uh, we are going to be looking at patients who uh, are, are managed by managing their glycemic control. Uh, we're going to try to avoid hypoglycemia as well. We're going to try to avoid ketoacidosis and also other hyperosmotic states. But we also, in addition to avoiding the acute problems 
in folks with diabetes. We want to manage and help prevent the macro and the microvascular complications. Uh, the retinopathy, neurop uh, neuropathies, and nephropathy, also cardiovascular, cerebrovascular, and peripheral vascular diseases. So all of these go hand in hand, which is really part of what makes diabetes complicated. Our long-term complications in diabetes that we're avoiding are all of these variable changes that we're looking at as it relates to uh, reducing the risk for uh, retinopathies and neuropathies and nephropathies for amputation risk uh, and also for other complications that happen associated with diabetes. So to prevent diabetes, lifestyle is a mainstay of therapy for all patients who are at risk for diabetes, who have prediabetes or are diabetic. And the basic issues we look at are diet and exercise. We are also going to be pretty aggressive with patients who have diabetes or metabolic syndrome and looking at their cardiovascular risks. So we find that uh, by managing their blood pressure fairly aggressively, often with an ACE or an ARB, uh, and controlling their lipids, usually with a statin, uh, in addition to controlling their glycemic uh, index and uh, providing adequate glycemic control, we can reduce the risk for all these complications. We also will monitor for, among other things, diabetic foot infections, uh, and those become really major issues. So lots of data over the last uh, few decades regarding prevention of diabetes and really good solid data that suggests that for patients who lose a good amount of weight, uh, that they reduce their uh, risk for developing diabetes by 50% or more. And so it depends on the study you look at, uh, but we can see that between a third and a half of patients who do good lifestyle changes can really prevent uh, diabetes. A study here that looked at a up to five kilogram weight loss with a relative reduction in risk for developing diabetes of 58%. That's pretty good stuff for uh, just uh, some lifestyle modification. We also want to look at other lifestyle issues like reduction in smoking. Uh, smoking clearly has an effect on uh, glycemic index and glycemic control as well. As we look at all of these issues, there's also data in addition to the lifestyle issues of diet, exercise, quit smoking, that for patients who have good glycemic control, good control of the hemoglobin A1C, they have uh, considerably fewer uh, micro and macrovascular complications uh, uh, as well. And so those are really important variables to encourage patients to achieve the best glycemic control they can safely achieve. And so you'll see what our goals are in therapy and how we achieve those goals as we review the American Diabetes Association guidelines. So let's first look at a patient, uh, an outcome risk for patients who have uh, uh, diabetes, particularly type 1 diabetes, but this could also be seen with patients to some degree uh, with type 2 as well, is the risk for ketoacidosis. Uh, but typically, this is that a type 1 uh, insulin deficiency patient uh, will present often with altered fat, fat metabolism and altered glucose metabolism, which results in elevated glucose ele levels in the bloodstream, hyperglycemia that spills into the urine and ends up with a glycosuria osmotic diuresis and a patient becomes dehydrated. In addition, uh, their cellular metabolism without getting adequate amount of glucose starts metabolizing fats leading to ketone bodies, uh, which leads to ketoacidosis. And the presentation of someone with diabetic ketoacidosis typically is someone who is hypovolemic, uh, very dehydrated because they peed out a lot of urine, peed out a lot of electrolytes, and they're also uh, having ketoacidosis with a, uh, a very low uh, serum pH. So as we look at ketoacidosis and its management, uh, we're so our treatment of ketoacidosis typically uh, is going to start with fluid replacement. We're going to almost always do that with normal saline. And we're going to keep them on normal saline till their blood sugar levels get in the range of 200 to 250. We're also going to start uh, with them treating typically regular insulin intravenously. Uh, 
there's also some data for another form of insulin we'll talk about, uh, Lispro insulin, which also could be given IV. But I think it's pretty conventional to give regular insulin IV. And we do it in a standardized regimen. Uh, usually it's around 0.1 units per kilogram as a bolus, and then giving them an infusion with the goal of getting their blood sugars down by about 50 or 75 milligrams per deciliter each hour. Uh, and so they'll be titrated to that until we get to about 200 or 250. Uh, and then we're going to look at backing off on that insulin drip. So we've given them saline aggressively. They may get three, four, five liters of normal saline because these patients are dehydrated. We started them on an insulin drip. The third issue we're looking at is their serum potassium. And so once we correct their glucose and once their pH gets back to normal, uh, you'll begin to see that potassium shifts intracellularly and their total body stores, which are depleted of potassium, become much more evident. And then we'll be quite aggressive at managing potassium. Uh, so I encourage how we do that. Typically, we'll give them 40 mil equivalents in a liter of saline, perhaps. But as often, we'll also give them 10 milliequivalents per hour IV. And if they're in a critical care situation and their patching is very low, we may go as much as 20 or 30 milliequivalents per hour on a monitored floor. Uh, but we're going to be very careful about uh, how we manage their potassium in conjunction with their insulin drip and with their fluid balance. When we look for otherwise uh, for patients who are out of ketoacidosis, uh, but any patient who has diabetes, uh, and we'll talk more about our goals in the last in the next uh, couple of uh, slides, both here and also in the second block. Uh, but we look for their hemoglobin A1C to be about seven or so is considered relatively good control for a patient, and we'll talk about how we set that goal what goal we set for what patients and why we picked that goal uh, in the second uh, presentation per se. Uh, but we'll also find that for pregnant women, we might get a little more aggressive, but we want to also look that not only their A1C, which man looks at their, their glucose control averaged over the last three months or so, we also want to make sure that fasting blood sugars are reasonable. And we're looking for their fasting blood sugars to be uh, anywhere between 80 and 130 for most patients. Uh, sometimes you want a little bit tighter than that, meaning you know 70 to 120, 70 to 110. Uh, but we really worry about most clinicians have looked at 80 is reasonable. Below 80, you start to get hypoglycemic. You also want to look at other goals for patients. We'll talk about you know their blood pressure, the lipid goals, and we talk about that also in cardiovascular. Uh, medicine block as well. Gestational diabetes, uh, we uh, will talk a bit in, about that also in the second block with the ADA guidelines, but typically uh, at uh, mid to mid-later pregnancy, we start to look at uh, gestational diabetes risks and measuring, uh, looking at fasting blood sugars, and also doing an, uh, uh, various testing uh, like a uh, glycemic challenge uh, for or the oral glucose test uh, to test a woman who, one who's pregnant uh, to evaluate uh, their risk for gestational diabetes. Uh, so the benefits of optimal diabetic management and good glycemic control is to redu reduce the risk for many of these long-term complications, as well as reducing the risk for shorter complications. So we're really going to spend a lot of our energy in getting good glycemic control with patients. That's diet, that's exercise, that's not smoking, but it's also the drug therapy, and we'll talk about that as a focus here in this blog. We also are going to focus on blood pressure management control. <clears throat> we also look at uh, an overview of our management with type 1 diabetes. We're going to maintain glucose levels, and we need insulin. All type 1 patients require insulin. For type 2 patients, we're going to do all the lifestyle things. We're going to layer on pharmacotherapy. We always start with metformin, uh, unless there's some contraindication to that. We'll talk about metformin in a bit. And then we'll start layering on other drugs. And which other drugs are next after metformin have really evolved or changed in the last four or five years based on the availability of new agents, but also based on data and comorbid situations. 
and we'll talk more about decisions of which therapies we will look at uh, in the second block. What we do to monitor for patients, all patients who are diabetic should do self-monitoring of glucose. There are uh, both obviously uh, personal devices patients will use for serum glucose, uh, blood glucose monitoring. Uh, but there's a lot of technology that's come to bear just over the last three or four years. Uh, there are devices that are subcutaneous and then go right to your smartphone uh, that tell you at any moment in time what your glucose level is. And particularly for patients who are type 1 patients or patients who have an insulin pump, uh, that's really helpful information to have. Uh, so it's really going to be uh, 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 important for us to evaluate. The other issues, there are some older tests, urine glucose monitoring, no longer that's done. Uh, but the glycosated hemoglobin is routinely done. Uh, and the reason, the, really what that offers us is it gives you a, an estimate of how much hemoglobin is glycosated, which is an indicator over time what the average glycemic control has been for the prior three months. Okay, let's now start to talk with the drugs, and we're going to first start with the insulins. Insulins are the basis for type 1 management, and they are used quite frequently in many patients with type 2 as well. Insulins are large proteins uh, that are typically given subcutaneously, uh, and we look at the nature of insulin being synthesized in the pancreas. The products that we have mimic human insulin for the most part these days. Uh, many years ago, we had pork forms or beef forms of insulin that weren't exactly the same amino acid sequence, uh, but most of the agents now pretty much mimic it. And what you'll see uh, naturally is that when there's glucose, that normally triggers the secretion of, of insulin, and insulin binds to insulin receptors ultimately to allow glucose to enter into the cell. Uh, and so that's basically what the role of insulin is. There are multiple forms of insulin that are available on the market, and I think it behooves uh, students to really more or less memorize this chart. It is an expectation in practice you recognize which are rapid-acting, short, intermediate, or long-acting insulin formulations, what their onset their duration of action is their peak effect are uh, because we mix these insulins. So typically what you'll find is typically in practice, patients will be on a rapid acting insulin plus a longer acting insulin like Glargine or Detamir uh, insulin. Uh, so the, in, in our practice, where I practice, most of the insulins we use are Lispro insulin. It's a rapid acting insulin. Regular insulin is pretty much limited to IV use and ketoacidosis, and we have a long-acting insulin, typically something like Glargine insulin. And we'll use these in combination to provide adequate levels of glycemic control throughout the day, and we'll describe a little bit more of that in a bit. So probably one of the most common, very short-acting insulins is Lispro insulin, a brand name of Humalog. Uh, and it can be given immediately uh, with a meal or right before a meal. Uh, and it can also be given or mixed with longer acting insulins, uh, depending on what the protocol is. Uh, and a unit of insulin is a unit of insulin, pretty much. So uh, if you're switching from one short acting insulin to a longer acting insulin or a long to a short, uh, or dividing the total insulin dose up per day into smaller increments, uh, you can pretty much know that a unit of long or a unit of short-acting insulin uh, might be interchanged one for another. It's the same units of insulin, but the delivery of that insulin over time may vary. And we'll talk a little more about that in a bit. Another short-acting insulin is insulin aspart, very similar uh, to uh, insulin Lispro, uh, and they are in many settings used interchangeably. A common long-acting insulin is insulin glargine, almost considered a peakless insulin. Uh, it has a duration of action of about 24 hours, so it's often given as a single subcutaneous injection. So insulin typically given subcutaneously, it's really only regular insulin that's given IV, uh, although there's some data for some of the other rapid-acting insulins to be given that way. Uh, 
uh, and that the long-acting insulins typically you want to make sure that the delivery of that insulin is uniform so some products require that to be slightly agitated or rolled in your finger hands uh, before preparation so it's evenly dispersed uh, when it's drawn up in a syringe. The sites of injection typically are going to be uh, either the upper arms, the thighs, or the abdomen, and we rotate sites to prevent problems with that. Uh, and there are some cases where we'll mix insulin in the same syringe. There are many products, though, now that are available that make it easier, combination products, that make it easier for patients not to have to actually mix different forms of insulin. The storage of insulin typically depends on the product. Uh, there are some insulin products that can be stored at room temperature once the patient starts using them, but routinely insulins before they're regularly used are stored in the refrigerator. They can then be out of the refrigerator for anywhere from 28 days to 42 days, depending on the formulation. The concentrations of insulin used to only, you know, really be the only insulin we usually think of is a U100 insulin. It's insulin that has 100 units per milliliter. But that has changed over the years. There used to be a very uh, a dilute form of insulin, a U40, that's no longer made. But they have had, since the 1980s, a U500 insulin, which is five times as concentrated. And the danger there is that if a patient erroneously had the wrong insulin concentration and miscalculated, a five-time dose than intended dose of insulin is lethal. Uh, this is a drug with a narrow therapeutic index. And so you really want to, as a clinician, be aware of those risks or those concerns. We also have U200, U300 insulins. Usually as pen delivery pens, we'll look at more of those in a little bit. Our goals in therapy, depending on what the patient's goals are, some patients we benefit from a tight glycemic control. Uh, meaning we want to control their blood sugars very tightly, carefully, uh, and we need a motivated patient to do that safely because the drawback for that is the risk for serious hypoglycemia. We're going to look at dosing, uh, and there are some standard approaches for how we look at dosing uh, in units per kilogram. But truth be told, we'll start maybe with initiating a unit per kilogram dose, but a patient will titrate and learn for themselves what doses of insulin work for them, and they'll have to get themselves to the point of recognizing which doses uh, they require for their adequate glycemic control. So to achieve this tight control, we really look to have to have a motivated patient who has a lot of patient education uh, and uh, uh, regarding how they uh, manage their glucose, how they use their insulin, how they diet, do the diet, all of there's lots of education that's required for patients, particularly as it relates to patients for whom we're giving them a fairly aggressive regimen to have tight glycemic control. The types of dosing with insulin, the older conventional dosing is uh, two or three injections a day. Typically, it might be a, a dose with breakfast and with dinner. Uh, and then, or three injections a day with breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, and that may be in a combination of a short and a long-acting insulin. But routinely what we'll do is we'll give insulin doses short-acting around meal time, and we may give a long-acting, what we call a basal insulin, uh, once a day to sort of overall, overarchingly control glycemic, uh, their glycemic control throughout the day. Intensive management, we may look at much more tighter control, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, uh, a little bit later. But with anyone who's on insulin, we really worry about hypoglycemia, particularly patients who, once blood sugars get uh, around 60 or so, many patients start to have classic sweating, elevated heart rate, maybe tremors, uh, and then it's not till they get down to 40 or 30 that they have a lot of lethargy or a coma or serious complications and loss in mental status, even risking seizures and brain damage or death uh, when we get very low. So it can be very problematic to have serious hypoglycemia. The thing with early symptoms is that they may be masked by a patient who's on a beta blocker, for example. So sweating, heart rate, palpitations, 
if somebody's also on a beta blocker, they may not present in those classic symptoms. Uh, so patients should know how they present with hypoglycemia. Some patients will tell you they're irritable and very hungry. Uh, so, but whatever it is, those patients should also, when they suspect they could be hypoglycemic, test, do self-testing for what their blood sugar is and respond accordingly. The management of hypoglycemia typically is to give them uh, glucose, oral glucose, usually 15 or 20 grams of glucose. That could be tablets. That could be a half a glass of juice. Uh, but you don't want to go overboard. But if they're not conscious, we could either give them glucagon or we could give them IV uh, dextrose. Glucagon uh, is a parenteral administered medicine. You can give it IM for a patient, and it works quite well as long as somebody has glucagon stores. The only patients who won't have glucagon stores are patients who are on a very uh, carbohydrate-limited diet where they're not making glycogen. Uh, and so in those patients, patients glucagon uh, will not work if they don't have adequate glycogen stores. Uh, there are lots of things we think about uh, when we're managing folks who are on agents for glucose control. We're worried about hypoglycemic reactions and combination therapies that could do that. Uh, we also have meds that can have patients worsen their glycemic control, particularly drugs like prednisone are notorious for that. Uh, and also beta blockers can blunt awareness. So the insulin dosing, typically we will start looking when we start a patient on insulin to look at their total daily insulin requirement. And for patients who haven't been on insulin before, this is usually something in the range of 0.3 units per kilogram per day. Uh, they may need more, they may need less. Uh, early on in therapy though, they may need much less. That's what we call a honeymoon phase uh, for patients. Ultimately, we're going to look at uh, maintaining somebody with basal insulin a long-acting insulin as well as short-acting insulin. There's lots of different regimens, and I'm not going to spend time specifically going into a lot of detail with those, uh, but we'll talk about them a little bit briefly. There's sort of some step-by-step -step guidelines I've listed here, but this is not the only approach to use when we do that. We also will look at correctional insulin, and typically these are is a, a way to calculate or establish early on whether somebody needs more daily insulin or not. And so if their blood sugar gets above a certain amount, we may give at X number of more units of insulin uh, uh, per, per time when we think that they're, uh, they're having a problem with glycemic control added onto what they usually get. Uh, there's also candidates, uh, patients who are on uh, continuous insulin infusion pumps and those typically are type 1 patients uh, managed by an endocrinologist. Also, you want to look at what our goals of therapy are for a patient. We'll talk more about that in the second block of things uh, and managing that appropriately. We'll also talk about hospitalized patients both in the second block, but let's talk about how we manage glycemic control with insulin in a hospitalized patient. Keeping in mind that when a patient's in a hospital, they're eating differently but they may also have a concurrent infection, which requires their glycemic control. If they're medically stressed, their glycemic control may have been worse because they're secreting more cortisol uh, and or they may be on prednisone. And so many patients, even if they're not on insulin at home, when they're in the hospital may require insulin. And we typically will manage patients with insulin in the hospital with three different types of insulin regimens. One is a basal insulin. This is a, typically one of the long-acting insulin forms like Glargine that's given once a day. We also will give insulin at mealtime. Maybe patients will get 10 units of Glargine at bedtime or in the morning. Some patients get it in the morning instead of in the evening. We'll also look at X number of units with breakfast, X number of units with lunch, X number of units with dinner. Typically, that's a short-acting insulin like Lispro or Aspartin insulin. And then on top of that, they may get what's called a control insulin that we give them a little more based on high blood sugars. So for example, before breakfast, the nurse will check the blood sugar. Blood sugar 
they normally would get three units of short-acting insulin with breakfast. But if their blood sugar is above 200, they get an extra two units of their short-acting insulin for a total of five units uh, or something like that. That's the control insulin. So usually the orders will merge the prandial with the control insulin in a standard order set, and the next slide shows that. So here's an order set on a computer order entry, entry system that looked at glargine insulin, uh, which was ordered daily, and then Lispro insulin uh, that was ordered uh, as a with both with meals and also a third order that ordered it on this scale that's listed here. You don't see the meal order in this slide, but there would be order something like maybe four units with breakfast. Plus, if the blood sugar is 185 before breakfast, they get an additional two units of insulin based on this protocol. There are lots of insulins that are on the market. Here's another sort of table that looks like the similar table we showed earlier. Again, important, I think, for you in practice to have familiarity with particularly the short-acting insulins, regular insulin, and the long-acting basal insulins as to their onset peak duration uh, of action. There are lots of different both concentrations and formulations of insulin. There are short-acting and long-acting formulations. There are in formulations that are 100 units per mil, 200 units per mil, 300 units per mil, or 500 units per mil. Uh, and so you want to make sure that the orders for insulin are done in carefully uh, and that you are accurate in what the insulin dose and in the product a patient has. It's confusing. Insulin, keep in mind, are very narrow therapeutic index drugs with lots of delivery systems uh, and different storage and expiration requirements. Uh, so it's really important on med reconciliation that we're very careful about that, okay? Let's spend some time reviewing what the drug options are in treating uh, diabetes, both type 1 and type 2. Uh, and before we get started uh, on reviewing all of the specific agents, uh, let's first talk about with type 1 diabetes, the only real drug therapy we use is insulin, uh, usually a short acting insulin with the assistance of artificial intelligence in a pump with uh, a continuous glucose monitoring that is integrated with that pump. That's become pretty much the standard of care. Uh, I think the difficulty might be for a subset of patients who have resource issues that the continuous glucose monitoring might be independent of the pump. Um, uh, there's a lot of education with that, but insulin alone and really a short-acting insulin is really the only therapy we use in type 1. In type 2 diabetes, over the last decade, a lot of things have changed. Uh, it's almost continuously the case that we see more data evolve with some agents and then agents that historically have been used go into the background, agents that have been put on the market in the last decade or five years or even shorter uh, are coming to the foreground as more and more data uh, indicate they have benefits. So let's go through what some of those drug options are. I'd encourage you to look through the latest standards of care for diabetes, and particularly the abridged version. In the abridged version, which is easier to read, uh, you, it's really important, I think, to go through the entire document as best you can, and then really focusing on the two major tables in the document in uh, chapter or section 9. One is this one table <clears throat> that talks about the, really the primary and some of the secondary agents that are used for lowering glucose in a patient with type 2 diabetes. And the second table is the algorithm table uh, in a number of slides ahead. Uh, if you spend some time with these tables and then understand the content that's on these tables, you will have grasped the major factors you as a clinician really need to know about each of these 
categories of drugs. <clears throat> so let's start first with insulin. <clears throat> As you look at insulins, again, type one, but also we can use it in type two. Historically, we've used insulin in type two diabetes when the first line oral therapies have waned. But we now have a number of options now in type 2 that for insulins, type 2 therapy is often delayed. Insulin in type 2 therapy is often delayed uh, uh, until we can have demonstrate the maximal benefit from a number of these other agents. And that'll become a little clearer in the algorithms in a little bit. When you think about insulin, <clears throat> both human and the analog insulins, they're quite effective at getting glycemic control in place. So as you look at these tables, each of these that are in the standards of care, look across the top in blue, you'll notice that there are certain aspects that they will compare different agents on key issues we think of as a clinician. So insulin is between high and very highly effective at getting glycemic control. Other things we are concerned about, though, is whether or not the agent causes hypoglycemia, and insulin clearly does that. It's a high-risk agent because of its risk for significant hypoglycemia. It doesn't do the things we want with weight. In fact, patients who start on insulin often will gain a little bit of weight, which in type 1 may or may not be a bad issue, but in type 2, it almost always is something you don't want to desire. Because we're so concerned about comorbid states, particularly cardiovascular and renal effects, the tables also talk about whether or not the specific agents have a benefit or a harmful effect in cardiovascular disease, both in individuals an effect on coronary artery disease and an effect on heart failure risk. Uh, and then in renal effects, if it delays the progression to diabetic kidney disease and or any other considerations in dosing, usually, that that particular characteristic drug may have. They also indicate whether the drug is available orally or subcutaneously. They share what the costs are with those. And then they talk about any other clinical considerations. So as we go through all of these aspects with insulin, you'll recognize it's highly effective, but the downside to insulin causes hypoglycemia significantly, can be associated with weight gain. Uh, it has no real beneficial effects on cardiovascular or renal benefit. It has to be given typically by injection. You can pretty much forget about inhaled insulins. Those aren't really used clinically. And then you have to be, there's a lot of education with injection of insulin. Uh, they, there are insulin site, uh, injection site reactions, but hypoglycemia is probably the biggest concern we have. So you can see with the less than optimal issues here, how we would want in someone who didn't require insulin in a patient with type 2 diabetes, we would want to forestall having to use it. There are a number of other agent categories or groups, some of which are first line, some of which are more second line options based on data, which we'll talk about here by different mechanisms. This slide alludes to that. Uh, and let's spend some more time talking about differentiating first the first line agents and then sort of spend just a little bit of time on some of the second line agents that really are not uh, uh, used all that often anymore in patients with type 2 diabetes. So of the first-line agents, almost everyone has historically started on metformin. So let's start with metformin. Metformin's been around for a couple of decades. Uh, it works to reduce hepatic gluconeogenesis. It has some favorable effects in insulin glucose uh, sensitivity in the intestinal absorption of glucose. It's available orally. It's pretty well tolerated, although it's a drug we usually start at a very low dose and work our way up because it's a drug that's associated with a lot of nausea and vomiting and epigastric dis distress and diarrhea. And so the way we avoid that is to start on a really low dose and slowly work our way up of dosing over the first few weeks of therapy. So for example, even though 
We usually try to get to somebody on a gram of metformin twice a day. Uh, we don't start there. We would often start with something like 250 milligrams once a day or 250 twice a day for the first couple of days and then work our way up to 500 twice a day uh, uh, and ultimately up to a gram a day. That when we start metformin, uh, you know, if we were to use an extended release formulation, there's a little less GI upset. But the problem in once a day dosing, which is easier for patients, but the problem with some of the extended release formulations are they're a bit more expensive or they may require a prior authorization. The other issue with metformin we worry about or think about, at least in long term, uh, and it's not like a major observation that we see this routinely, but we have so many patients on metformin, so we monitor for it, is a decrease in vitamin B12 levels over time. Rarely there's been a concern for lactic acidosis with metformin, uh, and so we're aware of what that looks like, which is displayed on the bottom of this slide. A and we're a little careful about using metformin in patients who have renal insufficiency because it may, may predispose them to that lactic acidosis. So the contraindications to metformin really are patients with significant renal impairment. We're a little more careful in older patients or maybe patients with heart failure, but we could still use it because the benefit of metformin uh, often outweighs some of these risks. You can see a pretty good efficacy with metformin, you know, 1% to 2% reduction in A1C. That's actually pretty good. The data for metformin and heart failure has been a sort of a controversial thing, but we use it pretty commonly uh, uh, in patients with heart failure. Now that we have all options that are effective both for diabetes and heart failure, we would probably in a heart failure patient start those before we start with metformin. So in summary with metformin, as you're thinking about metformin, again, summarize in this table, what is it about metformin that's good and bad? Well, the good news in type 2 diabetes is that it's highly effective, it doesn't cause hypoglycemia, and it's inexpensive. It's got a low cost. It's pretty neutral with weight change, so that's pretty good. Sometimes people get a modest weight loss, which is beneficial. There's a potential benefit in coronary artery disease. It has no bad effects in heart failure. It doesn't seem to have a, a benefit in reducing the progression of renal disease, but if somebody is already having significant renal disease, we would not want to give metformin. Uh, its GI effects are usually limited when we start low and titrate our way up, and you'd want to monitor for B12 deficiency. Until recently, every type 2 pa patient with type 2 diabetes would automatically start on metformin. That ha would have been a routine approach for everyone. Now, with a couple of other agents, there might be patients who have concurrent cardiovascular or renal disease where they may start one other agent before they start metformin. Uh, and so it's not now universal that absolutely everybody with diabetes starts on metformin, but it's still a mainstay place to start. That's metformin. Let's now move on to the uh, GLP-1 analogs. These are synthetic analogs of the human uh, uh, glucagon-like peptides. Uh, and these agents have been pretty revolutionary. They've been around for about a decade or so. They're pretty well tolerated uh, uh, with some adverse effects associated with them. We'll talk about them. But they actually have some pretty good efficacy and some modest weight loss associated with their use. The number of agents that we look here, there are a number of them. The most common ones here are available as a once-a-week subcutaneous injection. Uh, the two probably most common agents in this group are maybe Trulicity and Ozampic, uh, maybe Victoza is a third one you may see used. And the advantages of the glucose, uh, the GLP-1s, are a reduction in weight and then some benefits in both cardiovascular uh, and uh, some renal benefits as well as microvascular changes as well. And so there's really some pretty good data about the GLP-1s uh, associated with 
uh, decreasing appetite and decreasing body weight in conjunction with some micro and macrovascular changes that are beneficial in patients with diabetes. The first of the oral agents became available about three or four years ago was rubelsis, uh, semaglutide as an oral form. Uh, when I speak with other clinicians who have tried this agent, though, they find that there's a much more GI distress with it with the oral agent, and it's a daily dose as opposed to once a week dose. So sometimes patients who start on a GLP-1 analog as a once a week uh, subcutaneous injection, uh, the day after the injection, they have kind of a bit of a down day. Uh, they might have a little more GI distress, a little kind of vague symptomatology, uh, but that's limited to one day a week, and it gets better as therapy goes on longer for them. And the benefits with the GLP ones are pretty significant. In summary, the GLP ones alone here, let's talk about them. Uh, they're between high and very highly effective. They do a great job of getting glucose down. They don't cause hypoglycemia, though, which is great. They cause a, a pretty great uh, drop in weight. In fact, you'll see the GLP-1s are, receptor agonists are, in fact, a uh, there's a market brewing for these very same agents as weight loss agents. We'll talk about that in a bit with the next category uh, as well as a combination with the GLP-1. Uh, that's beneficial, certainly, in many patients with type 2 diabetes. There are cardiovascular benefits, uh, particularly related to coronary artery disease. So if patients have a coronary risk, which by default is true with everyone with diabetes, type 2 or 1, uh, that's beneficial. So that's put this drug in sort of a first-line status. In addition, there's real benefits uh, for slowing the progression to uh, uh, diabetic kidney disease. So you want to think about all of these factors, both the cardiovascular risk and the renal risk, render these drugs really becoming first line. The downside is that they are subcutaneous and they're high in cost. And, you know, while there is an oral semaglutide available, uh, it, its GI intolerance may render it more difficult to manage. There are a couple other concerns that are listed here for adverse effects. Pancreatitis, rarely reported. The GI side effects usually are temporary, but you have to encourage patients to think about what those are and how they can uh, sort of reduce that GI side effect uh, um, profile. Um, but in general, these are really remarkable agents. There is one product, at least currently on the market, that is a gastric inhibitory polypeptide in conjunction with the glucagon-like peptide agonist. Uh, and the example here is the Lilly product, Monjuro, an injectable uh, form of this combination. And the advantage that this has, uh, which is yet really to be demonstrated for a lot of other benefits we'll talk about in a moment, is that the addition of the GIP component really may improve some of the same aspects that the GLP-1 agonist does, sort of in almost in a sense in synergy. Uh, and so this graphic, in a sense, sort of portrays some of that. So the summary of this combination product, which is really pretty new, it's only been on the market for about a year or so, uh, is included in the 2023 uh, ADA guidelines. Uh, and the efficacy is higher even than the GLP ones alone, it does not cause hypoglycemia, and probably is the best of the agents for documented weight loss for patients. But the issues that we don't really know is, does the addition of a GIP add or subtract to the cardiovascular benefit that uh, we see with the GLP, uh, GLP ones alone? So we don't have enough data to really say that yet. Same is true for the risk in renal disease. So that may evolve over time. But I think a lot of clinicians because we don't have that long-term cardiovascular and renal effect data, might be a little hesitant to reach for this combination at this point in time, only because as clinicians who have been seasoned and around for a while have had the experience that while logically it seems like a new 
entity may make sense. Sometimes we find over long term that it's actually not beneficial and may even be harmful. So uh, this is an agent that I think bears watching. You may see patients on it, uh, but I, uh, you know, as of uh, mid early to mid uh, 2023, this is not an agent that you know a lot of clinicians in diabetes care are reaching for before they reach for a GLP-1. The other issue might be is the limited ability of a patient to uh, get it from the prior author what's on formulary because it's expensive. Now, the other side of the coin is that this agent probably is the, you know, the the biggest, the best, the gorilla of all of these agents for weight loss. Uh, and certainly in the lay press, this category of agents, this combination of agents is kind of touted uh, in lay terms as is this the new fountain of youth weight loss drug that's going to sort of replace everything else. We don't really know that. Um, so I think it poses the same risks as the GLP-1s without necessarily knowing other risks for the GIP component uh, and or uh, whether or not the GIP addition improves, is neutral, or worsens the cardiovascular and renal effects. So uh, next in the group are the SGLT2 inhibitors. And we talk about these also in cardiovascular medicine. Uh, and these are pretty remarkable agents as well. Uh, the, the advantage of these agents are they're available orally at a fixed dose. They work to uh, affect the sodium glucose co-transporter, which means that it blocks the renal reabsorption of glucose, meaning more glucose ends up in the urine. The potential downside of that is maybe an increased risk for urinary tract infections and or more diuresis secondary to the glucose in the urine, keeping in mind that glucose is an osmotic diuretic. But all of that has some potential beneficial effects in cardiovascular terms, particularly that the second image here uh, alludes to. So I think as in in practice, we see that the SGLT2 inhibitors offer some micro and macrovascular improvements. Certainly, we see that in heart failure data uh, and other data as well. So in summary, let's go to the, uh, the ADA summary slide. And here we look at that the SGLT2s have an intermediate to a high efficacy, not as much as the GLP-1s, but... They also don't cause hypoglycemia. They offer some intermediate weight loss, and they offer a clear benefit in heart failure and some benefit in coronary artery disease, as well as benefit in the progression of chronic kidney disease. They're oral. They're, fair, they're expensive. They're probably not quite as expensive as the uh, uh, the GLP ones are, but they're still quite expensive for patients. We're talking hundreds of dollars a month, uh, and with copays, it still may be quite high for patients. Um, and then the downsides to these agents is that there is a potential risk for DKA, although that risk is pretty is actually in practice pretty low and is usually outweighed by the benefit. Um, uh, and then a couple other concerns that have been sort of considered here in clinical considerations. Probably the most important one I think that you'd routinely look at is whether or not the volume status and the fluid status is affected by the increased diuresis. So you want to pay attention to that. So in a nutshell, the key drugs we see in practice in type 2 diabetes now are metformin, uh, GLP-1s, and SGLT-2s. These are now, as of 2023, the mainstays of therapy. The biggest speed bump is usually cost. Another speed bump for some patients for the uh, GLP-1s is the fact that they're almost all once-a-week injections. But all of that, the data is quite good. These are now, as of now, the mainstays. Let's spend a little bit of time in the second line, talking about the second line agents for type 2 diabetes. The second line agents really are 
I want you to have awareness of them because you'll see patients still on them. Occasionally, you'll see them patients start on one of these, but not all that often. Let's talk them through, though. First are the older sulfonylureas. They've been around for a long time. Uh, they work to affect uh, the insulin secretion. The older first-generation agents like chlorpropamide are virtually never used anymore. And the second generations like gliburide and glipizide are rarely still around, but because they cause hypoglycemia significantly, are really not an ideal agent to use. In addition, they've had some bad track record, actually harmful effects for cardiovascular risk, not beneficial. So sulfonylureas, the advantage they've had, and really the only advantage, is that they are cheap. They're, they're, and they're actually the other modest advantage, if you're looking at serum glucose levels, are that they are pretty effective at lowering hemoglobin A1c. But they are problematic with their hypoglycemia, their weight gain, and their clearance in patients who have some renal dysfunction. Here's a table of some of the older first and second generation sulfonylureas. I think I'd only even pay attention to maybe some of the second generation and you won't see them very often anymore. And even two decades ago, we knew these agents had a uh, a less effective track record compared to metformin as far as mortality risk. So in summary, the ADA guidelines talk about the sulfonylureas in that they are highly effective for lowering glucose, but the downsides. Hypoglycemia, weight gain, no cardiovascular benefit, maybe even a harm there, no renal benefit, uh, uh, and cardiovascular mortality and, and older data uh, is still sort of lingering for us as clinicians. The uh, magletonides, these agents like Prandin and Starlex, these are very similar to the sulfonylureas, uh, sulfonylureas, excuse me, except that they are dosed more frequently around meals. I have not seen patients on these agents either in recent history, so I would not worry about them, but you may occasionally see one of these. The uh, DPP-4 inhibitors, these are uh, dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitors that work at affecting the clearance of GLP-1. They're kind of a secondary way to get the GLP-1 levels up, um, and they offer may be some advantage in that they're oral where the GLP ones are typically injectable. Uh, but we don't see these agents used as much as we did when they first came out a decade or so ago. Probably the only agent you'll still see used occasionally is Genuvia uh, citagliptin. Um, but you'll see that these really work to really amplify glucose-dependent insulin release and inhibit glucagon release in a sort of a secondary mechanism. The adverse effects are uh, tolerable for most patients. Usually you don't see significant hypoglycemia, but they're not all that effective. They don't really work to get hemoglobin A1C down all that well, and they're still expensive agents to use. They're not very cheap to use. So in the summary table from the American Diabetes Association, their efficacy is only intermediate at best. The good news is they don't cause hypoglycemia, but they don't have a weight loss advantage associated with them, despite the fact that they have a secondary effect through GLP-1. Uh, they don't have a cardiovascular benefit. They don't have a renal benefit, and they're expensive. So really, these the DTP-1 and in 4 uh, inhibitors really have not sort of uh, stayed the course of use. We see a lot of patients who've been on these agents sort of now getting replaced with newer options. The glitazones, the glitazones have been around for a couple of decades now. Uh, the downside with the glitazones, and really the only one that's still on the market, is pioglitazone or Actos. The downside is that it has some significant risks associated with it, particularly heart failure and fluid accumulation risk. Even though they're quite good drugs at getting hemoglobin A1C down, uh, there are the newer agents are really more effective or better 
on all of the other reasons why we treat diabetes to lower those comorbid states. So the adverse effects, the biggest one is fluid retention, weight gain, which can cause an exacerbation of heart failure in a number of patients, and so we worry about that. It's also moderately effective for hemoglobin A1C reduction, uh, depending on the studies you look at. The data, though, look at the risks for problems with these drugs, cardiovascular risk being significant. So the bottom line is while the glitazones uh, are pretty highly effective, moderate to highly effective, maybe less so than some of the others are, but still considered by the ADA pretty high, and don't cause hypoglycemia. They cause weight gain, primarily fluid. Uh, they increase the risk for heart failure. They have no other real benefit. The only advantage they have is they're cheap. When I see anybody on a, one of these uh, glitazone th therapies anymore, they usually followed by an endocrine service who have maximized everything else before they go to one of these drugs because of the heart failure risk. Some of the last drugs to quickly talk about are the alpha-glucosidase inhibitors. These affect of the absorption of glucose in the intestine. They include precose and glycet. Uh, these agents don't really do all that much. They're not all that effective. They're not even in the latest of the ADA guidelines as mainstay options to use. And so you may occasionally see them used, but they've pretty much waned in the set of guidelines. You may still see these agents used. And another uh, agent that has sort of gone by the wayside is uh, Simlin, although this may still occasionally be used. This is an agent that is similar to the GLP-1s, uh, and you may occasionally see patients on, still on this agent, but not nearly as often as the standard GLP-1s. It's considered uh, similar to the GLP-1 agents, uh, but not really a routine agent that's used very often. Adverse effects are also sort of concerned risk for maybe more hypoglycemia in this case than was with the uh, other related agents. So the second chart that I think is important for you to spend some time looking at to sort of see the algorithm of agents is this one in the guidelines, and I refer you to the guidelines to spend some time in this chart. We're going to sort of drill down to the main things here. But what you'll see is at the very top of this chart is the self-directed uh, management of diabetes for patients, really having them uh, do patient uh, diabetes support, self-managed, uh, uh, diabetic self-managed education and support, uh, which is referred to as uh, DSMES. Uh, in their approach. And you want to kind of look at all of the barriers for them to get optimal care. So we spend a fair amount of time throughout the curriculum talking about what are the speed bumps for patients to lead the cardiovascular healthy lifestyle, the renal healthy lifestyle, weight loss, good education, food, what's the motivation, is there current, current di uh, depression or some other factor that's affecting their taking care of their diabetes. All of those are sort of critical in this algorithm before you even start with drug therapy. But then they have sort of the left side of this chart uh, are patients who have cardiovascular risk, and the right side is what you think about for patients who have a glycemic and weight management uh, risks and how we kind of think about these agents and where they fit. And this algorithm subtly changes almost every year now in the last five to 10 years with the ADA based on whatever the latest data is for particular agents. Let's walk through that. So for patients who have a cardiovascular risk, you want to know, is it a risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease? Is the risk for heart failure or is there a risk for chronic uh, kidney disease? So if they have an atherosclerotic risk, uh, you want to kind of look at the agents first that have the most benefit, and that's the GLP-1 or the SGLT-2s uh, are the ones that have the most data. Now, the speed bump for patients is going to be whether those are covered or not in their prescription benefit uh, what's their copay, because they're quite expensive. That's going to be a speed bump for patients. 
Uh, the other issue might be the, the concern for uh, the GLP ones that are once a week injectable. But patients can get by that. They can usually do pretty well with that. And that shouldn't be a reason not to sort of go there. For heart failure patients, everybody with heart failure, they look at the heart failure guidelines pretty much now. SGLT2s are the proven benefit. That's the agent you're going to start with. Uh, and then for patients who have chronic kidney disease, they're spilling a little bit of microalbumin in their urine. You're going to look again for the agents that have the renal benefit, and that again is going to be SGLT2s or GLP1s. Okay, So you want to kind of be clear about what their risks and the benefits are and really zone in on what makes sense there. So patients who have diabetes are particularly type 2, we're always going to be concerned about their cardiovascular risk profile, their renal risk profile. So the role of the SGLT2s and the GLP1s are clearly uh, marked, uh, as we alluded to before. But we're also considering the maintenance of their glycemic control and their weight management. And for glycemic control, metformin has been the tried and true agent that most patients who have type 2 diabetes are usually started on. That's historically true. That is still true. I think the only exception and what's evolving is where the GLP-1s and SGLT-2s sort of fit uh, from the point of view of cardiovascular benefit if there's comorbid states, cost issues for patients' acquisition. All of those sort of render whether or not those are used in place of metformin or in addition to metformin. But most clinicians still start on the left side of this, this particular slide uh, with, with metformin and then looking at whether or not you need to use a more effective agent to get their glycemic control in line, which you can see these listed in the green and the yellow as sort of the better choices there. And on the right side of the screen, weight management, we're always trying to do that with non-drug options. Uh, and and then when you need to consider a glucose-lowering agent, picking a drug that concurrently is associated with improved weight loss. Uh, and then again, green and yellow are the agents that you're going to look at as sort of the primary agent you'd consider there as well. So all of this sort of in summary lists to what as a clinician the algorithm you want to think about or go through. Uh, and then keep in mind that the ADA guidelines, as they change, you know, every year, sometimes more than every year, uh, uh, you want to see if there's any recommendations for anything that's subtly different or not so subtly different. A couple of the quick things as we're finishing up with diabetes. Uh, whenever you get diabetic patients, we're also looking at infectious disease complications. Two of them uh, are diabetic foot and then osteomyelitis related to diabetic foot. So with diabetic foot risks with patients, we're always doing good foot care, good hygiene, uh, and we're looking at diabetic foot infections being polymicrobial. We wanna do whatever we can to prevent diabetic foot. And our treatments of choice depend on how severe that lesion is. Uh, we're also looking at managing this probably with a wound consult. Maybe the area has to be debrided. Maybe you're going to a wound clinic for the patient, as well as starting antibiotics. And in the hospital, we're typically going to do polymicrobial coverage with usually anaerobe coverage. You might look at ampicillin sulbactam, maybe piptazo. Uh, or ertapenem, sometimes a fluoroquinolone, although that's probably less common these days, uh, or a third generation cephalosporin plus flagellum metronidazole. And if MRSA is a real concern, maybe adding vancomycin or linazolid. There is a topical agent, Regranex, that could be used. It's limited in its use. Usually I've only seen that used at wound clinics. Uh, for patients with diabetic foot, and they don't really replace systemic antibiotics for a significant uh, diabetic foot. Anyone with diabetic foot ulcers, you worry about long-term osteomyelitis, uh, and so those are going to be concerns as well. The classic 
presentation and characteristics of osteo are listed in this table. I'm not going to spend or belabor that here. Our empiric treatments for osteomyelitis, uh, here's some for pediatrics, which still could be a risk in a pediatric patient, but usually that's not diabetic. The more classic presentation in diabetic, diabetic foot that leads to osteomyelitis would be seen here. And again, we're going to identify what the pathogen is, and often if they have osteomyelitis, typically patients will need uh, four to six weeks, up to three months of IV therapy, uh, and sometimes followed by oral therapy as well. What we'll talk about in the second block are some of the other complications with diabetes, uh, what we talk about in cardiovascular medicine as well is blood pressure control, uh, lipid uh, management in patients, uh, renal function. In 2024, uh, the adjusted guidelines really have not changed well, all that much from 2023. Uh, here are some real themes that have been added or nuanced to the 2023 guidelines. Um, basically, they recognize that patients who have individuals who have diabetes often have a lot of inertia related to their diabetes. So there's been some focus on uh, guidelines or recommendations to how to manage uh, patients who may not be motivated or, or have difficulty in motivation uh, for managing their diabetes and also looking at psychosocial barriers to that as well. They also look at focusing on new screening and heart failure, particularly because the SGLT2s have such a dramatic benefit in heart failure, independent of their role in diabetes. They have some focus on peripheral artery disease. They have uh, guidance with a new monoclonal antibody uh, in the delay of type 1 onset, uh, onset of type 1 diabetes. That really would be in the domain of the endocrinologist to examine. Uh, but if you have someone who is at risk for type 1 diabetes genetically, that might be a consideration. You may look at those guidelines, but then make a referral probably to the endocrinologist. Uh, there's more guidance on the obesity meds, particularly the GLP-1s and the GIP, GLP-1 com combinations. Uh, uh, not that much is really different from 2023, except there is a, a really in the last year, much more recognition and use, at least in North America, of uh, the GLP-1s and the GIP, GLP-1 combination agents uh, in managing weight. They have guidance on uh, the diagnosis and classification of di uh, diabetes, uh, just a bit there. They have uh, some more focus on managing hypoglycemia. Uh, there is, in the last few years, more recognition of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in diabetes uh, and really uh, paying attention to that in primary care. There's an emphasis on bone health, uh, more so than in the past. Screening and managing folks with different disabilities, how to, how to differentiate uh, and manage those. Uh, enabling uh, healthcare providers to really utilize whatever technology is available. Uh, artificial intelligence, uh, looking at the kind of uh, referrals that happen, eye exams, telehealth, digital tools for patients, and to also look at the possible association of COVID infection with the onset of type 1 diabetes. In addition, the 2024 guidelines look at some updates in immunization, particularly with the addition of RSV vaccines in patients over the age of 60, uh, if patients have diabetes, emphasis on cultural sensitivity, psychosocial issues, uh, importance and advancements in diabetic technology, particularly uh, continuous glucose monitoring and automated delivery of insulin uh, in the new systems and the artificial intelligence that's around that. Uh, and also more emphasis on inclusion and patient-centered care. A couple of other tables, they have kind of reframed things a bit in addition to supplemental information, uh, other supplemental information This in the 2024 guidelines is a little more guidance on preventing inertia with patients with type 1 or type 2 diabetes, ways to empower patients, ways to optimize their care and treatment, and to leverage the existing tools and technologies that 
might be amenable to a subset of the patients for whom they might be open to those newer tools or technologies. They also emphasize the role of injectable therapy and type 2 diabetes. And uh, while I think it was somewhat clear in the 2023 guidelines, they made it even more explicit in the 2024 guidelines, is that for patients with type 2 diabetes almost universally, they are going to recommend uh, GLP-1s or GIP-GLP-1 combinations before insulin. Uh, and they're only going to recommend insulin uh, starting first in a small subset of, uh, of individuals, which is listed in the second column here. Uh, they talk about combinations of insulin and other non-insulin injection therapy, uh, when that would be appropriate, uh, and some other issues related to injectables here. But the bottom line is we are seeing much less use of insulin in type 2 diabetes than we had seen in maybe the decade before the availability of the GLP-1s. Uh, and so expect that we are going to layer on GLP-1 agents or GLP-1 and GIP combinations plus the SGLT-2s and likely in metformin still. Uh, before we ever look at insulin in the great majority of patients who have type 2 diabetes. Other things they talk about is a checklist for patients who are on insulin, both type 1, which is everyone in type 1, and also patients in type 2, looking at the availability of resources that are available for patients, the types of formulations of insulin that are available, uh, the appropriateness of doing continuous glucose monitoring in those individuals and enhancing uh, the technologies that can be used to leverage improved glycemic control and better diabetes management. Here's a list of some common drugs still used in diabetes management that you may be expected to have some familiarity with dosing. Uh, I did not include here the GLP-1s and the SGLT-2s only because there's an array of different agents available. Um, and uh, the particular dosing can be a little more complicated. But expect that in type 2 diabetes, you're going to see many patients still on metformin and many patients on GLP-1s, SGLT2, SGLT-2s, uh, and also you should be familiar with standard uh, insulin dosing as it relates to uh, what we see in the hospital for control, prandial, and uh, um, uh, basal insulin regimens. Uh, in addition, patients who are type 1, you should differentiate the types of insulin that are available, but almost everybody who has type 1 diabetes is only going to be on a rapid-acting insulin in their pump, uh, and they have no need for any other insulin usually because the pump does all the work. All right, hope this is helpful. There's a lot in diabetes. It's uh, evolved quite a bit in the last three or four years. Uh, we'll try to spend some time in class reviewing some of the uh, specifics about how to manage diabetes in your, in, when you see patients with it, and you will see many of them with it.